I think we're ready to start. Thank you so much for coming. It's always uh, 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 delightful to be here at Utrikes Politiska Institute, the, the Swedish uh, Institute for International Affairs. And this is the second of, uh, um, uh, of a series of events that uh, the Stockholm University Institute for Turkish Studies, of which I'm the director, uh, and uh, UI, the Swedish Institute of International Affairs, uh, is collaborating on. Uh, the first was a panel on Turkey-EU uh, relations, and uh, in today's panel, we're sort of lifting our eyes and looking at Turkey uh, and Turkish choices in an unstable region uh, in an era of uh, shifting geopolitical uh, alignments. Um, we um, are joined today by uh, three eminent uh, speakers, uh, and we have a, a guest who just arrived from, from Brussels, um, a person whose uh, opinion and analysis, uh, especially uh, but not exclusively uh, regarding Turkey-EU relations, I personally uh, value uh, very greatly and whom I, whom I always read at the latest this morning, I think your latest uh, uh, paper on, on, on Turkey-EU relations uh, with, at Carnegie uh, came out, which I recommend. Uh, Mark uh, Pierini uh, is uh, a visiting, currently a visiting scholar at the Carnegie, Carnegie Europe. Uh, he focuses on developments in the Middle East broadly uh, and in Turkey from a European perspective. Uh, 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 Mark Pierini was a career EU diplomat from December 1976 to April 2012. He was EU ambassador and head of delegation to Turkey. Uh, during an important period in Turkish-EU relations, uh, 2006 to 2011. Uh, he was also an ambassador uh, to Tunisia and Libya, uh, 2002 to 2006, to Syria, 1998 to 2002, and also in Morocco, 91 to 1995. Uh, ambassador Pirini also served as the first coordinator for the Euro-Mediterranean Partnership, uh, or also known as the Barcelona Process, from 95 to 98 and was the main negotiator for the release of the Bulgarian hostages from Libya in 2004 to 2007. Uh, welcome, Ambassador Pirini. <laughs> um, we are also joined um, by um, Ambassador Mikael uh, Salin, who is a colleague of mine at the Institute for Turkish Studies, and I have his CV on my, or his bio on my phone, if I can um, get that up. Um, uh, ambassador Salin was uh, Sweden's ambassador to Turkey uh, in, uh, what years was it, 1996? Five, 1995 to 1998. He has also been uh, in uh, uh, former Yugoslavia, Macedonia. In, uh, he was EU special representative in Macedonia, ambassador to Norway special envoy also to the Sudan, uh, and uh, among other things is also the founder and the first uh, director general of the of FBA, Folke Bernadotte Academy, which trains Swedish uh, uh, foreign service uh, officers. Um, currently, he's a, a distinguished visiting fellow with uh, Suits, uh, my institute, and also uh, at the same time with CIPRI. Uh, and uh, he's also chair at the Department for Security Policy of the Royal Swedish Academy of War Sciences. Welcome, Ambassador Salin. And then, uh, last but not least, uh, UI's own uh, Bitte Hamagen. Bitte Hamagen, uh, whom I think is a familiar face to many of you, it has long experience of, of covering uh, the region, uh, Middle East, uh, North Africa, and she's currently head of the Middle East and North Africa program at UI. She is a, a well-known author uh, and a former Turkey and the Middle East correspondent of the Swedish uh, daily Sanska Dagbladet uh, between 2001 and 2012. She was based in Istanbul for two years, uh, uh, 2009 until the outbreak of the Arab Spring in 2011, and has been following and commenting on Turkish and uh, MENA uh, affairs for a number of years and to the benefit of us all here in Sweden. Welcome, Peter. So, um, 
We're dealing with, of course, uh, today a topic that is uh, in rapid flux. Turkey in a, a dynamic and changing uh, neighborhood. Following the impending defeat of uh, ISIS, uh, the war in Syria is entering a new phase where Turkey plays an important role in the Astana and Sochi talks on de-escalation zones and in its military operation right now in the uh, Idlib province. In Iraq, the situation has grown more tense between previous allies, Baghdad and the Kurdistan region, while the threat from ISIS diminishes. This increases the risk for new conflict lines on Turkey's southern border. Meanwhile, Iran, a major power in the region, ex in, is expanding its influence in a geopolitical struggle against its old foe and neighbor, Saudi Arabia, which leaves Turkey uh, on the margin. Turkey, a longtime NATO member, nowadays has all-time low relations with both the United States and with the European Union, whilst relations with Russia have improved but are uh, thought with complexities that we'll discuss today. In this volatile neighborhood, Turkey, until recently known for its failed zero problems with the neighbor's policy, now tries to redefine its uh, regional and global role. And this is what we uh, will be discussing today. And I will uh, invite the, the uh, speakers to give rather short, around eight minute presentations to begin with. Uh, and then we'll follow up with a discussion and, and a quest, uh, uh, questions. Uh, and then finally, we'll uh, leave uh, some 20 minutes or so for you uh, in the audience to also contribute and ask questions. And I know there are several of you here who have significant expertise that we could also uh, benefit from. So with that, um, Ambassador Pierini, would you like to begin? Thank you, Paul, and thank you all for being here. I'm still adjusting to the difference of temperature with uh, Brussels, and don't forget I come in originally from Marseille, so November in Stockholm is a bit difficult, but okay. um, I'll start for, with a simple premise that all politics are local, and therefore uh, I will look now at the main domestic policy evolution, political evolution that I see in Turkey and the way they impact uh, foreign policy and relationship with the EU. And um, as you've heard, I spent uh, five years as ambassador to Turkey and I've been since working more than five years on Turkey from Brussels. And <clears throat> in terms of uh, domestic politics, I see three main drivers uh, uh, that have an influence on, on foreign policy. The first one is a 15-year, and it's not discussed very often, 15-year failure of Erdogan and the AKP to impose a religious conservative norm on the society. Uh, the society in Turkey, as we all know, is split about in the middle. And um, despite all the efforts that so far the leadership has, has made, um, it has not transformed the society. Perhaps now, this year, with the constitutional referendum and all the powers being concentrated in one hand, this is finally happening, but it has been, uh, so far, uh, a failure over the 15 years. And it has, of course, external implications, the sympathy with the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, the absence, the lack of real fight against ISIL, and so on and so forth. This is also part of the picture. The Second domestic political feature, which is very important and which we saw in full since August 2014, when the current president was elected for the first time uh, by direct vote with 52%, is his majoritarian view of democracy. Uh, essentially, what uh, President Erdogan has said since is that I have been elected, I have a 52%. Vote. I have a mandate. Everything else has to be aligned on that mandate. That includes the legislative branch, the executive branch, the judiciary, and of course, no dissent with all that. And <clears throat> unfortunately, what we saw, fortunately for that concept, I mean, what we saw in the next election, which is June 2015, June 7, uh, is that the Turkish citizens said the opposite. They sort of did a sort of rebalancing act, and the AKP was still in, in, in the lead, but with 40, 41%, so no single-party majority, as had been the case since November 2002. 
um, and HDP, the Kurdish origin party, as number three. That was a revolution. And of course, in any uh, democratic or Western democratic concept, this would have led to a coalition government. Of course, the president uh, entrusted the prime minister, Davutoglu back then, to do that, but didn't happen. Uh, then the conflict with the PKK was reunited by both sides. And, and, and then uh, uh, dissent was gradually suppressed more, more and more. The third uh, f domestic factor, which is extremely important in today's foreign policy, is that to make up for the losses of the AKP and to reflect this uh, reorientation because of the rise of the Kurds, there is an alliance between the AKP and the Nationalist Party, MHP. That has an implication, of course, which is more anti-Kurdish than ever before. Um, and, and, and of course, it comes along with something which is a long tradition in Turkish politics, uh, but is now a prime political instrument, which is conspiracy theory. Okay? So this is the setup in a very simplified way, as I see it from a, a, a European perspective. Now, how do we read all this in terms of foreign policy and policy with, with the EU? Well, first of all, I briefly mentioned it. There was no real fight from Turkey against ISIL. Uh, the fight was primarily against the Syrian Kurds to separate them. Uh, and nothing much has been done against uh, ISIL. And that has been a growing problem, not very visible to the naked eye, uh, with European and American counterparts in terms of counterterrorism. And by which I mean foreign fighters coming from essentially Europe through Turkey and going to Syria, and right now uh, the returnees, of course. And this is not an issue that you can solve by broad principles or broad statements. It's an issue that you can only solve one by one. You have to track these people and make sure that you snatch them before they enter Turkey or before they leave Turkey to return to France or Belgium and so on. And this is currently as I wrote in my uh, latest blog that you kindly mentioned, Paul, uh, is one of the top priorities of, of uh, Europe with, uh, with Turkey. Secondly, of course, the attitude of uh, Turkey with the Syrian Kurds uh, clashed with the attitude of the U.S. with the Syrian Kurds. As you all know, uh, the U.S. Uh, is fighting ISIL, but with very limited ground involvement, something like 2,000 special troops, uh, and barely two uh, very basic airfield, airfields in northern Syria. So they rely on proxies, and these proxies are the YPG. The YPG is, of course, uh, considered by Turkey as a branch of the PKK, and that inflates the problem between uh, Ankara and Washington. At the same time, you've had a prolonged negotiation between Washington and Ankara on the use of the Incirlik, Air Force Base to fight uh, ISIL in, in northern Syria, and, and of course, uh, a difference of views about the future role of the Syrian Kurds in any future settlement on, on, on Turkey, on Syria, sorry. Uh, now, in the meantime, in the middle of all this, we had the coup, or the failed coup, in July 2016. Uh, the fallout of this is essentially a massive purge, as you all know, first and foremost in the armed forces and police and intelligence, uh, but also across the board with free thinkers, I would say. Uh, so 150,000 people lost their job, 50,000 people are, are in jail, scores of media have been closed, associations, universities, and, and so on. That is, in the eyes of the Western world, a weakening of Turkey a weakening primarily of its military capabilities, but also a weakening of its uh, credibility and, and standing. And that weak position has been, as we've seen gradually, uh, exploited by Russia, uh, especially to overturn the Syrian position on Assad. So by now, uh, Turkey has accepted that Assad will stay, although regularly writing uh, the opposite, like uh, 
this morning or yesterday morning, the, an advisor to the president, Ibrahim Kalins, writing in Delhi Sabah that, no, he cannot be the man to reconstruct uh, Syria, but yet the Astana talks, the Sochi uh, discussion, uh, this is all based on the assumption of Russia and Iran that, of course, Assad will stay. So you have a sort of bipolar policy of Turkey there, which is not exactly clear to everybody. But, of course, the embrace by Ankara of the Russian policy is linked to the diplomatic weakness, weakness and relative isolation with, with the West. Among all of this, what you have is a rule of law totally in shambles in, in Turkey. There's nothing that resembles uh, a Western democracy anymore. Everything is directed by one person and his entourage. Uh, so you don't have counterpowers, you don't have checks and balances anymore. This is all over. Not formally, because the new constitution that the president wants is not enforced, but in practice it is. And this indeed results in a Turkey which is no more EU compatible. So if the commission, the European Commission, my former employer, uh, is uh, true to the political criteria of the accession process, the report they will issue next April will say Turkey is no longer fully, or what is the formula? Suffici sufficiently satisfying the political criteria. There's no escape. The Commission cannot ignore what has happened in Turkey. What consequences they will draw is a different issue. But the, the main fallout in the foreign policy realm is that Turkey is now formally separated from EU compatibility. I'm, I'm nearly finished. It is even more separated as a partner, a political ally, that in March this year and again in September, for their own uh, domestic reasons, the Turkish leadership, starting with the president, used terminology such as Nazis, reignite the gas chambers, or don't vote for the enemies in Turkey, of Turkey in the German elections, that are really the bridge uh, too far. And, and uh, that is another breaking point, if you want. I finish with something that is probably more for Michael to, to, to discuss, that among all of this, you have, of course, an additional problem, an additional fallout between Turkey and NATO, Turkey and the US. And that is part of the current game. Not so much that the US is, is like the EU putting the value-based relationship in the forefront. It's more a security-based relationship. But there is a point where uh, you cannot ignore it, and this is where the US is now getting it. Did I stop early enough? <laughs> that, I think that's, that's very good. So we, the, the division of labor that we've agreed on and that we're going to try to stick on is, is that, that uh, we'll first have, have a focus on Turkey-EU relations, then on NATO-Turkey relations, and then Turkey in the, the, uh, the Middle East, uh, uh, essentially. You just There's a lot of talk, uh, Ambassador Pierini, about uh, um, the notion of an, a transactional relationship uh, now you talked about the many the many challenges that Turkey EU relations are currently undergoing, and traditionally Turkey EU relations have been framed within the uh, EU enlargement uh, framework, and that's to, to, to a great extent it's, it's a rules based and also a norms based uh, relationship whereby the applicant state has to fully uh, adapt EU uh, legislation, harmonize uh, internal legislation, but also show that they, they embrace uh, EU norms and basic principles. Um, and then you have another type of relationship, and that's the sort of long-term strategic alliance relationship where, which Turkey has with Na its NATO partners. And now, now along comes this additional notion of a more transactional uh, relationship, which is uh, sort of an issue-based bargaining type of, of relationship. Do you think that that is something that Turkey-EU relations is moving into? Um, should it? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? What's your reflection on this? Well, certainly there is a temptation right now on both sides, knowing the impossibilities I just mentioned, uh, or the incompatibilities, uh, to move to a, an issue-based relationship. Uh, although we're not talking of the same thing exactly on both sides. 
In, in the view of Ankara, uh, while not willing to admit that the accession negotiations are dead in the water because this has implications for the financial markets and so on and for prestige reasons, um, but quite frankly, they'll be happy to have a purely commercial relationship uh, which they see as a totally non-conditional thing. And as you will see in a few days, uh, Carnegie, one of my colleagues at Carnegie, Sinan Ulgan, will produce a paper on uh, the customs union modernization, which is one of the big subjects right now, where obviously we have shared interest. Business on both sides is very much in favor uh, of that. But <clears throat> it is not conditionality free because customs union means the full integration of your production system. And in that case, if we large the customs union, your service system into the European. So right now, with the current customs union, if you are Ford or Mercedes or Renault producing in Turkey, it's like producing in Germany or Spain, exactly the same thing. Uh, nobody knows about it, but this is a reality and it's been profitable for both sides. Now, if we move that to the banking and insurance and retail trade sectors, it would be even more. But to be able to do that, obviously, you need a level economic playing field. You need economic justice. You need same competition law, the same or similar, similar uh, public procurement law, similar trade union law. None of this exists right now, and it's even less than it was before. So, and you also need transparency in the processes of public uh, procurement. Which so is that that is uh, a typical example of an issue based relationship, but it's not that either. Then, on the European side, the other issues that Europe is very keen to handle with Turkey is one, counter-terrorism, okay, because of this flow of returnees and how you can get into the details of that if you like, but it's extremely complicated and it's really a one individual by one individual issue. And of course, the refugee agreement, which has been contrary to Ankara's narrative, ex working extremely well. I'm not talking of the morality or legality of the deal, but the practicality of the humanitarian assistance to Syrians in, in Turkey. And now we are on the verge of discussing the second three billion tranche. So these are the kind of issues that could be basis of a transactional relationship, except that this will not... Uh, uh, stop the, 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 the dismantlement of rule of law in Turkey. Uh, and therefore, this is where we have a medium and long-term problem. Very good. Thank you. I think we'll have uh, an opportunity to return to, e to the EU-Turkey uh, relationship. Uh, Ambassador Salin, uh, uh, so it, it looks rather bleak on the Turkey-EU front. I'm sure that Turkey-NATO relations, Turkey-US relations are much better. <laughs> Thank you for being so hopeful. Um, I would like to, uh, well, thank you for inviting me also to build on what Mark Pirini said by referring to some uh, figures that I have in front of me about what opinion polls tell about attitudes inside Turkey. Uh, and uh, to mention those figures is for me to mention the factor of action reaction and in fact uh, negative spiral that uh, is taking place where policy actions influence uh, public opinion and vice versa in uh, in some sense. So the figures I had uh, in mind, uh, I will quote uh, an article from Tengiz uh, from Etting Gürcan. It says, last year, poll respondents said Mr. Middle Eastern countries pose the biggest threat to Turkey, but this year, 66.5% said the United States is the worst threat to Turkey. Uh, and uh, uh, up from 44 last year only. Last year, 14.8% uh, uh, thought that strategic cooperation with Russia could be an alternative to EU membership. This year, that figure reaches 276 So these figures alone say something of uh, the way the, the vicious circle somehow also takes place in the interplay between government level and popular level. And of course, uh, mutually 
inspiring and uh, therefore the question of how to change that uh, negative spiral becomes very complicated because there is a cost to what is being said and what has been done. Um, to, uh, talking now about NATO um, and referring to that figure that uh, of course there is a long history of a bumpy road in those relations between Turkey uh, given Turkey's size and, and pride, if you like, and NATO, we, we all remember the incidents around 2003 on the occasion of the in intervention into Iraq and the Turkish parliament, newly dominated by the AKP party, uh, decided to say no to the US and its request to open a second front in its, uh, in its intervention to, into Saddam Hussein's Iraq. And that, of course, uh, had a negative impact on relations, both with the, with the US and with the NATO collectivity, even though it was not NATO uh, being the actor at the time. Still, um, so uh, even re reminding of that incident, yes, there has been uh, a bumpy road and uh, there has been uh, um, incidents uh, where the anti-Western rhetorics have been higher than usual, so to speak. So one has to remind that it's not just a thing about the present, it has, it has a history, and it has a history beyond the current regime as well. I remember, for example, Gerald Knaus told me, we all know Gerald Knaus, uh, there was a movie made about the incident when Turkish troops were surrounded by US troops uh, in northern Iraq at the inception of the intervention. And that, that incident was later made into a movie, and that movie, of course, heroizing the Turkish troops, was the most popular movie in the history of Turkish uh, film industry. I don't know, Jenny, if that's true, but that's what... Uh, so it says something about attitude. Now we have a situation where... Gerald Knaus, by the way, head of a think tank European Stability Initiative. Yeah, I'd say a lot to do with the uh, migration deal at the time. So, uh, when we are talking about NATO, we have to distinguish, of course, between NATO as a collectivity and the Porian Stoltenberg's attempts to uh, hinder uh, relationships to be uh, spiraling too quickly. Uh, for example, uh, the head of NATO, Jens Stoltenberg, said the other month that no big deal, uh, even the word angst was used, there is no angst that Turkey has apparently at the time, now I think confirmed, decided to uh, opt for Russian uh, air defense system. It's called S-400. Uh, whereas in many other NATO quarters, bilaterally and, and in the headquarters of NATO as a collectivity, there has been a lot of angst about possible consequences of a NATO member country decided uh, for its national defense purposes, there have been patriots uh, deployed there on leave from various member, in the member countries and everything, but now the question of the big step of actually acquiring an own system. And of course, as a, as a NATO member country, uh, Turkey would be expected morally and politically, maybe even sort of legally, to uh, go for a system which is NATO compatible. Uh, and, of course, there, there was a, an attempt at the time uh, to uh, look at China for delivery of those. And, of course, uh, we have the Italian-French variety, SMTP, which uh, was discussed also for Sweden, by the way. And uh, there was various questions of whether uh, the Turkish, uh, uh, Turkish acquisition would be linked to demands to have co-production, technology transfer, all those things, which would be part of the build-up of the, of the autonomous Turkish defense industry. In the end, Turkey decided to go for Russian system. And that system, uh, Russia already has in Latakia, in Syria, and the capacity, maybe you can correct me this, Stefan, uh, of that system is such that it uh, brings about more or less total uh, non-interventions uh, non, uh, non by other, others plane, hostile planes into the range of coverage of that system. So it's not, it's not uh, a small thing to, to decide on this. And should there be such a system deployed, it will take time, it will not be deployed until 2020, the way things look now. 
But once you have a system, one is Russian-owned for several, perhaps, in, in Syria and in neighboring Turkey, there will be another Russian such system. And the question, of course, of would, will this be relevant at all to the collective NATO defense? Or will it be something else? This is a huge question, potentially. But for NATO, uh, it is a question of how, how to handle this, both before the final decision on the part of Turkey and then after it, when it becomes a reality. I think that line has now been passed from what Erdogan said the other day. Uh, it's a step, and it means a step into uncharted territory when it comes to, to, uh, uh, to, the, to the system. So this is one thing. Of course, that was highlighted the last week when this incident in Norway took place. And Norway is, is, of course, where the General Secretary of NATO comes from, Jan Stoltenberg. And uh, the incident was one where uh, Atatürk and Erdogan jointly were somehow portrayed as the enemy in, an, in a NATO exercise in Stavanger. And that uh, created uh, all hell in, in, in reactions by Turkey. Not so much that to have Atatürk and Erdogan jointly pointed out as, as uh, the enemy, because uh, recently uh, I think Erdogan has rediscovered the value of, of having some kind of link to Atatürk. That's a long story in itself. This is NATO, the collectivity, and then you have the questions of relations Turkey to individual NATO countries, especially the US, but there is also Netherlands and, uh, and Germany and others, and all the issues that have arisen in recent, recent years and months between those countries. In the case of the US, I read in the column the other day only uh, from someone uh, that uh, what we see now in the US is a repetition. It started in December 2013, so the columnist said, when the corruption case uh, erupted, and then you had the coup, at, uh, coup attempt in, uh, in uh, July 15, and now they, the uncertain they, are making a third attempt, this time through a legal case against Mr. Zarab in, uh, uh, in the US, and he is linked to Sorry, I, and he's linked to uh, the question of rulership and legitimacy in Turkey. So I will round up saying that uh, I see the, a huge dilemma for the NATO leadership to be, uh, because in view of the value strategically of Turkey, in view of the nuclear weapons in the Indian base, in view of the missile defense radar in Malatya, and also concerning other other things related to the Syrian crisis management. All these things makes Turkey and the relationship with Turkey so important, but there are strains now. And with the steps that may be considered right now, we'll see what will be decided in, in uh, Sochi today, uh, of some bearing to this, Syria, YPG, etc. There will be uh, interesting developments to follow. Thank you. Uh, very good. Uh, Mikkel, uh, just wondering how, how to read this. Uh, somebody who's, who's been working on Turkey uh, for, for a long time, uh, I, I, um, I, there's a, a lot of people use uh, uh, the metaphor of direction, uh, westward, eastward, and so on. Is, is it, uh, can we say that uh, Turkey... Uh, angered by American support for the Syrian Kurds, Kurds the YPG, uh, PYD, which Turkey claims Last to be a, a PKK uh, uh, affiliate, uh, essentially, and some other uh, developments, that they are now turning eastwards. Is it that, that uh, Turkey is looking towards Russia as sort of a new strategic alliance? Or are we seeing something uh, something else? Is it is this the wrong way of reading it? Mm. What do you think? I, I'm looking forward to hearing Marx and the Beatles views on this also. But um, I think that it is correct to say that Mr. Putin, uh, being the host of today's meeting, is cleverly utilizing uh, signs of weakness inside Turkey, inside the EU, and inside NATO in dealing with all those things. So what I, what I see in brief is uh, the, the Russians outmaneuvering many other players, enhancing in the Black Sea region, in the Middle East region, Russian 
influence uh, that is both reflective of Russian interests, uh, put in interpretation, and exploitation of perceived weaknesses. Therefore, you can say, but please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that, as someone said yesterday, uh, Turkey is being drawn into the orbit of Putin-led influence right now. Will it be permanently and forever? That cannot be said. I said uncharted territory, but this is a trend. Because uh, Turkey sees that it has no other way to turn, to compensate for the loss of cordiality in other relations. And it does perceive, I know that from many conversations I had, that there are risks involved in being too dependent for gas delivery, for strategic support, for dealing with uh, Syria, etc. Uh, too, too strong dependence on, on uh, Russia. But we are not at that point yet. But things are happening now that could lead to un um, unforeseeable consequences. But I think that many in Turkey realize that, oops, beware, because if you push this Russia dependency too far, then there'll be huge costs for Turkey, historically speaking. That would be my short answer. Very good, thank you. So uh, now we've uh, we've discussed Turkey EU relations, uh, Turkey NATO US uh, relations, and we've also had a chance to, to discuss Russia. Uh, and now we're turning a little bit more towards uh, the region, the Middle East, and uh, and Turkey's role therein. Russia outmaneuvering a lot of other players. Uh, uh, is Russia doing that in the region as well? What about uh, Iran, uh, Bitte? Thank you. And I feel very humbled speaking after these two prominent speakers. And I was thinking, what will be the leftovers for me after they've talked? But I will try to put on uh, the Middle East glasses, having just come back from visits to Iran and Qatar. So how, how is Turkey seen from the regional perspective? I think one can say that uh, in the region, we are now witnessing uh, sort of the reminiscence of three old empires, the Russian, having the initiative in many ways, and the old Iranian historic legacy, if I mean the legacy of the Safavid Empire, those who founded the Shiite uh, Twelver Islam, the, the founders of modern Iran. And, and today's Iran is seen as the... In, inheritors of, of that legacy as they are filling the vacuum piece by piece, which they have done after the fall of Saddam Hussein in Iraq. And Iran, ironically, um, is fighting ISIS for a religious background because ISIS, where their um, Wahhabi thinking, consider Iranian Shiites to be apostates heretics, whereas NATO member Turkey has not been fighting ISIS. On the other hand, uh, Iran does not get sort of a, a recognition from this in, in the West. This is how they see it. But they have a much more of an initiative than Turkey has. And I think this is also due to Turkey turning its compass around so many times, changing its tune so many times. And um, Turkey being seen as an impulsive actor in the Middle East. It's not seen as a consistent actor. And this is also a reason why it's losing ground. And one can also say it's ironically, at the same time when the, when the Sochi summit is taking place just today with the presidents of, of Russia, Iran, and Turkey, paving out their initiatives for the next Geneva talk in Syria, there is also a meeting in Riyadh with the Syrian opposition, the High Negotiation Council. And Turkey is then not taking the lead of that. Turkey is on board of Russia. Uh, and of course, the Syrian opposition is fragmented. It, it's uh, in turmoil. The leader of the Syrian opposition just uh, resigned before the meeting in, in Riyadh, which is a, another sign of how disastrous also, Turkey's policies has been in, inside Syria. Um, if I take two examples of, or three examples of how I've seen it, uh, Turkey being inconsistent, let me just start with Syria. Uh, I mean, Turkey used to be best friends of Bashar al-Assad. Erdogan used to, to have vacations together with Bashar al-Assad. 
And then after the uh, eruption of the Arab Spring, Turkey thought, we know how to handle Bashar al-Assad. They completely failed. Because Turkey had such poor intelligence, even though it's the inheritor of the old Ottoman Empire who used to dominate Syria for hundreds of years. They didn't understand the core of the regime. Of course, Bashar al-Assad was not willing to relinquish any power to the Muslim brothers that Turkey was hoping for. And when that failed, Turkey uh, helped to militarize the opposition, which became a disaster for the Syrian democratic opposition at the end of the day. And they thought that defectors from the army, free Syrian army, would be able to, to get the regime to crumble. Of course, this failed again. And when it failed, so. Turkey was desperate, opened up its borders to anybody, Salafi fighters, weapons, cash flow, etc., which meant another angle to the militarization of, of the opposition. We all know the result. And now, where are we today? Well, there was a time when Turkey used to be fairly good friends with the Syrian Kurdish uh, PYD, of which um, Mike Pierini spoke before, and its fighting force, the YPG. They even used to fly in its leader, Salih Muslim, in government airplanes to Ankara to hold meetings. Then they broke off completely, and they're now designing its the YPG being the main enemy of, of Turkey inside Syria. And... Um, <laughs> Meanwhile, they are also uh, changing its tune completely, and they might go back to a case where they might realign with Bashar al-Assad in Damascus. So it's going full circle, sort of. And this could be the eventual outcome of, of the, the follow-ups to the Sochi meetings. And after that, we've seen those incredible losses in, in, in Syria. I would say that the disaster in Syria, there were many um, actors behind the disaster in Syria. There was Turkey who opened up the gates. There was Bashar al-Assad who opened up the prisons to the Salafi jihadists who became the rude fighters. So he got the perfect enemy. And there was, uh, of course, the Gulf states who provided... Um, uh, Fighters, money, weapons, etc. So there are many cooks in, in, into this. But Turkey might go full circle. And this means that many actors in the region feel that we don't really trust what Turkey is saying to, today because the message might change the, the next day. It's not consistent. You could say it's the same thing with um, uh, northern Iraq and um, the uh, Kurdish regional government. When Saddam Hussein, Saddam Hussein fell, Iran was supporting the idea of the federal state because they knew the balance of power it would be. Turkey was, to begin with, against uh, the, the US invasion, but then they changed its tune, opened up a consulate in Erbil, and started to profit from the contacts with the Kurdish regional government. They got the oil flow from Erbil to Jehan, the port, and they got trade. Turkish businessmen flew into to the Kurdish region, made big money. And then came the time for the referendum that Barzani called for this autumn, as you know. And Barzani must have thought that somebody, some of his neighbors, was not against the referendum. And he must have thought that actually Turkey was not really dead against it, because this is how the message was understood. And this is also what my Turkish friends are saying to me, that Erdogan didn't express last year a full, you know, complete uh, re um, denial of the idea of, of a Turk Kurdish independence in northern Iraq. So Barzani might have thought that there is no red light uh, from Turkey's side. From Iran, there was a red light all the time. They said, we supported the, the, the referendum, uh, the uh, autonomy, but not the independence. And what happened now after the disastrous referendum from the, in the region is that the Kurdish region lost the disputed territories, and Iran and its allies moved into Kirkuk, not uh, Turkey. And uh, Iran and its allies are taking the initiative uh, when it came to closing down the airspace. Turkey is more reacting to, to the case. And, and also Turkey, on the issue of Iraq, has sort of 
gone full circle on, 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 in terms of Baghdad. Last year, uh, President Erdogan was using very tough language against uh, the um, Prime Minister of Iraq. Let me go to my notes to see what he was actually saying. Um, uh? Yeah, exactly. He said, you should know your place, and you are not on my level, etc., etc. And and what happened after the referendum in Iraq? Suddenly, he invited Haider al um, Abadi to to uh, to Ankara as if nothing had happened, as if these harsh words had never been spoken again, because he knows now that he has to make friends with him in order to eventually get the oil flowing from Kirkuk and to Turkey again. So to sum up, I would say that regional players see Turkey as the impulsive actor, not being consistent. It's not somebody that you know in, who's, in what direction it's going. And therefore, it's like you said, the ground here, it, it's, very, it's very shaky in the region. And I would say that players in the region, they judge Turkey from what it's doing, not from what it's saying. And at the end of the day, there have been, um, it's, yeah, I think I finished there. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it... Huh? Uh, in fairness, you could argue that Turkey is not the only impulsive actor in, in the region. Now we have an American president who seems to be taking pride in his unpredictability and impulsivity, uh, which, and perhaps his visit to the region, which uh, was then shortly or immediately followed by a, a, a conflict uh, involving uh, Turkey's sort of uh, you know, long-term or, or at least stable ally, Qatar. Uh, and then you have a new actor also in, in Saudi Arabia, of course, in a, a country that you know very well. Um, a lot of people are, who, who also seems to be quite young, quite ambitious, and quite uh, impulsive also. Um, um, you spoke a lot about the Turkey, sort of Iranian relations, which I find, to be honest with you, rather difficult to read uh, myself. You have continuous economic uh, uh, trade and sometimes rather harsh rhetoric and uh, advertised accommodation. Um, but uh, what about the Iran? Uh, Saudi Arabia uh, uh, rivalry and how that is sort of shaping the developments uh, right now? My reading is that Turkey doesn't want to get involved into the Iran uh, Saudi Arabian rivalry. They want to be make friends with both sides. And one of the reasons is geography, of course. And, and um, Turkey and Iran, to my knowledge, holds the oldest intact border in world history, which is very interesting. It's a mountainous area. But it's also the fact that these two big entities agree that they don't agree on anything. They don't go into war with each other, uh, but they are not close friends. Turkey helped Iran during sanctions, this old for oil for gold exchange that maybe we can come into later speaking about the Zarab case. Um, and Turkey and Iran share a common interest in uh, not wanting Kurdish independence in northern Iraq. So uh, there they have a common ground. I'm not sure that they really have a common ground when it comes to the issue of the Kurds in Syria. Uh, I've heard Iranians speaking to me um, in a more informal way, saying that uh, we would be okay with a federal state in, in Syria, meaning that the Syrians in Syria could have the self-rule as well. Saudi Arabia in this part of the region, Iraq and Syria, has lost its ground so much. And uh, therefore, Saudi Arabia now is lining up with Trump and, to some extent, Israel. And when you speak about the uh, similarities between Trump and, and Erdogan, I remember that Tom Friedman wrote in New York Times that Erdogan and Trump are like twins separated at birth. <laughs> <laughs> Which tells you something about the impulsiveness. Well, anyway, Turkey wants to have trade relations, investment, tourists from Saudi Arabia. I mean, when the uh, Europeans are no longer coming to the Turkish hotels and beaches. They want to have tourists from both Iran and Saudi Arabia. But on the issue of what's happening on the Arabian Peninsula, the fight between Saudi Arabia and Qatar, 
They are standing closer to Qatar, of course. They've sent troops there. But these troops in Qatar, they are insignificant if Saudi Arabia, with the support of Trump, would decide to invade Qatar to overthrow the emir. It's, it's, it's just symbolic, I would say. Um, thank you, Bitte. And I, uh, that concludes the sort of first segment of, of uh, the discussion, these initial uh, presentations. I should say to the audience that when we initially uh, planned this event, we wanted to also have a Turkish representative who could give us Ankara's perspective and Ankara's reading of developments in the region and also uh, of, of uh, ch uh, challenges to the relationship with its, its uh, traditional allies. And we had uh, tentative agreements, or actually, okay, from, from, for three different, from three different people. One of them was senior advisor to, to Erdogan, another one uh, a senior person in, in uh, the uh, closely affiliated with the public uh, uh, television station TRT World, and, and, a, a, and a third independent analyst with close ties to the government. Uh, unfortunately, that fell through, and that's why we don't have somebody really pushing the the, uh, the Ankara's perspective. So let me maybe briefly take on that uh, that role, uh, if you will, and push back a little bit, maybe maybe uh, mainly on the first uh, two speakers, because from Turkey's perspective, I mean, th things don't really have to be this bad in Turkey-EU relations or in Turkey-US relations. Uh, Turkish demands are really quite simple and reasonable. Um, from uh, when, it, when it comes to re respect to relationship with the United States, if the United States would only stop uh, providing material uh, support to a, an actor, the PYD, Syrian Kurds, uh, who uh, occupy the largest land border to, to uh, Turkey uh, in uh, northern Syria, and who are closely, organically tied to uh, a group, the PKK, which the United States and the European Union and Turkey all agree is a terrorist group and enemy number one of, of uh, Turkey. If only the United States stopped supporting them, which constitutes an essential threat to Turkish national uh, security, and if they would only hand over the person, Fethullah Gulen, which all evidence shows, according to the Turkish government, was responsible for masterminding the failed uh, military coup against Turkey. Things would be a lot better. And when it comes to uh, the European Union, uh, if only other senior Gulenists uh, who are, have sought shelter in many other European capitals were extradited so that they could face trial in Turkey for uh, the coup that killed over 250 people. Uh, and uh, if the European unions didn't uh, continue to shelter the PKK, which are very active in many European... This is, these are the, the quite reasonable demands from the, the Turkish government. This is the, the Ankara perspective. Things would be a lot better. What's your response? Thank you for showing your Turkish hat. Uh, in this discussion. Uh, well, first re reflection is that here too, all politics are local. In the US, you have no appetite for sending 10, 50,000 troops to northern Syria to fight ISIL. Therefore, you need a proxy. And the only proxy available was YPG. So there we are. It is, uh, it's been the subject of a very intense discussion between Washington and Ankara, uh, especially what happens once ISIL is defeated, but we should also remember that in the back of this debate on the role of the Syrian Kurds against ISIL, you also have a sort of memory of hostile moves by Turkey against the US. We mentioned the 2003, I think Michael mentioned that, uh, incident during the, the, the Gulf War, but you also have more than one year discussion to allow U.S. Air Force to use Angelic against uh, ISIL. Uh, you have the most recent divulgation by the state news agency, Anadolu, of the positions of uh, American and French special troops in northern Iraq, which is a rather shocking move from a NATO ally. Uh, and that was pretty detailed with a map and the number of troops and the type of gear they were having and airfields or no airfields, and so on and so forth. So these things are, are pretty shocking in, in, in the U.S., along with other things. So that is one. On the Gulen thing, which is, of course, the uh, recurrent message that we get from Ankara, 
Well, the first thing is that you have to remember that from the minute the AKP came to power in November 2002 until 17 of December 2013, uh, the AKP and ISMET, the Gulen movement, were just, you know, hand in hand. Uh, people like me, when I was the EU ambassador to uh, Turkey, or, you know, the Belgian ambassador, the German ambassador, we wouldn't work with uh, Gulen organizations for a very simple reason. No democratic institution, like a foreign ministry in the West or the European Union, can work with a movement, which is a sect, you don't know the statutes, you don't know the funding, and you don't know the membership. So you just don't deal with them. But we were forced to deal with them by AKP ministers who said, well, wait a minute, Mark, you, you don't like it, but they are our allies. Okay? So this whole thing is, is uh, the creation of President Erdogan himself. Uh, this alliance fell through because alliances uh, uh, have different fates. Uh, and now you see in the narrative, a very subtle use of uh, fake terminology. You may have read everywhere, PKK, ISIL, Daesh, YPG, FETER. FETER is Fetelarist Terror Organization in, in, in Turkish. It's an invented acronym. It doesn't exist by definition. The Gulen movement is called ISMET, uh, which means service in, in Turkish. So this acronym was invented by the Turkish government, to avoid saying Gulen and to allow for lumping the Gulenists together with all the other uh, terrorist organizations. Well, that's relatively smart because you can see in a lot of the Western foreign policy literature, Peto being reproduced uh, by people because it becomes standard language. Uh, but in the end, uh, this is a political uh, debate that is owned by Turkey and that will be sold by Turkey. Turkey has tried several times to involve European companies, German companies in particular, European governments to, to, into the, the, the Gulen uh, debate. Well, there, there are no proofs. And, and of course, then you have the clash of rule of law. Uh, you, you've read that 85 boxes of proofs have been sent to the U.S. Justice Department to explain how the Gulen movement was the culprit. And so far, no result. But in the end, uh, you may know that an extradition procedure in the U.S. is in the very last step signed by the Secretary of State. And the very last step includes the probability for the extradited person to face a fair trial in his or her country of origin. And of course, that test, the Turkish judiciary doesn't pass, of course, right now. Now, your last question is more important, uh, PKK. There is a complaint by the Turkish government that the PKK has been roaming free in Belgium, in Germany, and elsewhere, that you can find uh, PKK flags and banners with Ocalan in the European Parliament, in squares, and so on. This is true, and this is a true problem. So there you, you have uh, uh, an issue there that, that will need to be discussed. But on the other hand, one must say that t the Turkish state negotiated with the PKK also. Yeah. Mm. Mikael, I don't know if you want to add something. I think that, that was an answer also to the, to the U.S. relation. But I just read this morning that uh, a, a Turkish sort of uh, senior advisor to, to President Erdogan uh, floated the idea of uh, pulling out of NATO. Now, when I speak to, to previous uh, Turkish diplomats, this is something that they say, you know, Turkey, Turkey's NATO membership is the cornerstone stone of Turkish sort of foreign and security policy. There, that's never in question. It cannot be in question. But now you have a sort of senior person floating the idea. Uh, you know, should we ask the question, is, is Turkish NATO membership, continued NATO membership, uh, is it uh, a... Uh, um, can we can we assume it, or is it something that can be will will likely to be seriously discussed on both sides of the Atlantic? You think? I had meant to remind also that uh, the government named Ismet Ismet Peter long before or well before the coup. 
and still uh, using the word terrorism. So that says something about the political climate at the time and, and quality. On this, uh, I uh, can only repeat uh, a paper, uh, about uh, uncharted territory. Um, I, my hunch is that uh, we are going to be in a very, very uncertain, bumpy period as from today and throughout the time till the elections, whenever these will be. I doubt that it will last all the way until November uh, uh, 19, the way things look economically, politically, etc. But that's another issue. Because the basic trend of things are that the president is going to be increasingly dependent in his rhetoric in order to win those 50% of an anti-Western rhetoric. Uh, this uh, is by, by nature of things, because he may, has to make sure that the, the investment made in that narrative be honored. He now realizes that in order to win those 50% and for his party to win the majority in the parliament, uh, they, they, those things are both are needed for the functionability of that new system, by the way. And, the, and before that, we have the municipal elections, which is another tricky thing about Istanbul and Ankara. So uh, the dilemma is that I think that uh, most, most would say that Tragically, this uh, narrative is needed, uh, and that will feed into uh, negative perceptions, and then you have this vicious circle. Uh, he now thinks, uh, after 50, 11,000 opinion polls, that he may not win, appealing only to that vote, and hence this reference to Ataturk now race. He needs to broaden, also because of the competition from uh, Meral Akshner's new party in that uh, nationalist part of the of the uh, of the um, Turkish polity, so in all this, uh, there is a risk of uh, action-reaction process worsening relations between Turkey and NATO, uh, similar to what can be said about the EU. But I do think that uh, the uh, jury is still out and will remain there for a long time still when it comes to the real alliance. Things, but there is a sort of a holding operation to see how the power struggle in Turkey uh, is sorted out, what will be the outcome of it, and how the Syrian crisis and the Iraqi crisis are finally settled before there will be clear signs. Meanwhile, this uh, uh, the uh, tendency for Turkey to be somehow having to work at the mercy of and on conditions defined by. Vladimir Putin will be a trend because of force of necessity. That's what I think. Mark, did you did you want to come in? Uh, yeah, just one one addition. Uh, you referred to this latest uh, statement by uh, presidential advisor on quitting NATO. We referred before several of us to the S four hundred. This is a surface of things. This is an incremental process. You have a number of steps that show that there is an increasing divergence between. Uh, Turkey and NATO, yet Turkey is still in NATO participating in the common structure and so on. What is important to note is that this is not happening in a vacuum. You have, within the Turkish military and intelligence apparatus, you have a tendency, a trend called Eurogenist, which is totally anti-Western, anti-EU, and that group is linked to Russia. Okay, So don't think that uh, you know, you're talking of selling missiles here and publishing an op-ed there in Daily Sabah or whatever, just in a vacuum. This is a Russian strategy that has been at work. Uh, similarly, uh, it has been at work against uh, NATO. Uh, I mean, we are in Stockholm, so you know all the incidents in the Baltic Sea better than me. Um, it, has, it is part of a Russian strategy as well. So the worry is not just that where is the Turkish president going to go next for his own needs and his own political necessities in the next election, or no election, by the way, uh, yes, because there is yes. a hypothesis that the election, presidential election will never happen. Um, but it's also a function of the Russian strategy. That's important to keep in mind. 
I'm wondering if I may switch tracks uh, and uh, and talk a little bit about the Kurds. Uh, and when we're talking about this region and the, the shifting geopolitics, of course, the Kurds are an important actor and also sort of a, a, a subject of, of actions by, by many others. And you have uh, Turkish troops, I, th I think we've mentioned, uh, as part of this, this uh, this uh, uh, trilateral uh, discussions with the uh, Iranians, the Russians, and, and the Turks. There are these uh, so-called de-escalation zones in Syria. And as, as part of that agreement, you have Turkish uh, uh, presence in uh, Idlib. Uh, 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 and and uh, while the focus is ostensibly on, on, uh, on uh, jihadist actors in Idlib, uh, there's, it's also the case that you have Turkish troops sort of positioning themselves uh, uh, to uh, and, and some analysts are talking about he, that they're p potentially, and Erdogan is also sort of, you know, hinting at this more or less uh, uh, overtly, that uh, this province of, of Afrin, uh, uh, held by S uh, Syrian Democratic Forces and the, the YPG, the, the Syrian Kurds, that they could be uh, an, a next uh, a target when the this fight over ISIS uh, uh, calms down. And then, of course, you have the situation in uh, in um, uh, in Iraq with KRG, where where which you already mentioned, um, and you have uh, the Syrian. Kurds uh, having had American support having been very, very important uh, to them. And uh, what some uh, analysts are, are, are worried about and some Kurds are worried about uh, is, of course, that when once ISIS is defeated and the, America, Amer the U.S. no longer needs the Syrian Kurds uh, in, in the struggle against ISIS, that the Americans will leave them sort of by the wayside uh, to their own destiny. Uh, where does this? Where do, where do developments leave the the Syrian Kurds and also the Iraqi Kurds? It's a big, <laughs> difficult question. I, I think this has been the the fate of the Kurds in the region for during history and during modern history that they're being used by different factions for tactical reasons. But they, at the end of the day, big powers make other decisions, have other agendas. And for the time being, I think that the YPG see the U.S. as the sole protector for the time being, but it's temporary. It's, uh, and I mean, Turkey could have changed, could have held a different position. Had they not broken the peace process with the PKK in 2015, had they continued to, to deal with the YPG as they did uh, they would not have been fighting this, the Kurds in the region. They could have been fighting against ISIS instead. But they took this uh, strategic decision, which has been detrimental for Turkey and for the region. Mikael? May I add, um, you mentioned Idlib and you mentioned Afrin, the, the third of the three cantons in, in, in northern Syria. I think what is happening in, in uh, uh, Sochi today is an attempt, uh, I, say, I talked about out, uh, Putin outmaneuvering others. Um, forgive me for if you, anyone takes offense for my saying so. But it means concretely that Russian-led uh, policies will be a first a question of what to do with the former Al-Qaeda, Al-Nusra, HTS in Idlib now. So far, under the de-escalation scheme agreed in Astana, the Turkish uh, army has entered, was even escorted mm. into its observation posts uh, inside Idlib in order to uh, avoid unnecessary carnage. And Putin <laughs> wanted that. He didn't want to go head-on against the remaining jihadist uh, group uh, other than ISIS. Now I saw that the supreme commanders of the three uh, countries decided in their preparatory meeting to go after HTS in Idlib. Meaning that the observation post that was stage one in this process uh, is uh, uh, ended and that uh, what is expected now is of the, for the Turkish army to do the, if I may say so, uh, dirty work uh, asked by the Russians to go after the remaining powerful faction inside Syria. And then um, uh, Assad is going to exploit that 
in various ways, and uh, because he, uh, his agenda is to reconquer the whole of Syria. Russians have not decided to allow that to happen yet. The role for Turkey in this, and that's why I say outmaneuvering, because once HTS is no more, if and how, wherever that happens, then the next target will probably be SDF. Conquering or dom Syrian dominating... Syrian democratic forces dominated by the Syrian yeah, Kurdish. Dominate, uh, dominating 20% of the Syrian territory now. So it's a major, uh, major existence. But as you say, relying more or less exclusively on US support for their mm -hmm. survival. Mm -hmm. Russians have been unclear so far, mm -hmm. to what extent, in Afrin and elsewhere. So the, the big game is between the power play, Russian-led, and how to allow Assad, if at all, to uh, establish his rule in the whole country. And for the, for the Geneva process, this is going to be a huge dilemma, because the only compromise left open now is for these de-escalation zones, and to have some. Otherwise, the whole game of the town is to administer Assad coming back, which is not what the U.S. wants but they haven't been able to say so clearly. And I think Turkey's role in the Sochi talk is now um, to, to veto the participation in Geneva yes. of uh, the Syrian Kurds and their delegation. And, and um, every principle, um, the international principle, has been compromised in, in Syria. It's so disastrous for the international community and with the Russian veto to follow up on the chemical weapons, etc. And so many countries following into Russia's tune there. Put note on this. Um, we all remember that the military intervention of Russia in Syria is mid-September 2015. Two weeks later, when President Putin spoke at the UN General Assembly, he gave his political blessing or political recognition to the Syrian Kurds and has never moved away from that. They have even engineered meetings between the regime, Assad regime, and the leadership of the Syrian Kurds. So whether they will drop that altogether at one point or not, we don't know yet, but there is a promise there. There's a political promise that the Syrian Kurds very much hold uh, dear. I wonder if I could just switch tracks a little bit and go back to something that you spoke about earlier, partly because it's one of my areas of interest, and, and uh, we were at a, a some of us attended a seminar uh, yesterday at Medlovs Museet uh, where, where this was discussed. Also, I'm wondering when it comes to Turkey-EU relations, uh, did the EU throw out morality and uh, sort of ethics, if you will? Uh, with the uh, joint statement on refugees, the so-called refugee deal, do you think? Yeah, very uh, useful question. I think we, if we backtrack to 2015, in the spring of 2015, everybody knew, and the Commission was documenting this to member states, that a big wave of refugees was coming from Syria for a very simple reason. At that, that point, uh, that is six months before the Russian intervention, the Russian army, the, sorry, the Syrian army was crumbling. And as part of the effort to make up for these losses, the regime was going after the educated youth, the men at university, uh, that were prolonging their BAs or MAs in order to escape conscription. Okay? This is a huge effort, police knocking at doors and uh, bringing people in, and that has a simple meaning for, and I talked to a number of these uh, refugees in, in Brussels, uh, it means that you're snatched by police, you're sent to military training for two weeks, and you're just out of your English BA or you know medicine studies or whatever, and then you're sent to the front line. So there's a huge incentive for these people, part of the upper middle class, uh, to leave. And we knew that. Commission made a proposal in May to the Council about refugees, asylum, and so on. But the divergences between member states on asylum, as we all know, are so huge that this went nowhere. Then came the summer, and of course, all of this, as predicted, unfolded with a huge uh, influx from Syria, plus the international mafias moving these people around, adding to these people from uh, Eastern Africa or 
Eritrea, from Asia, and so on. And then there was political panic, obviously. Uh, and when the uh, German government met early in September, they took a decision, which is still now being paid in polit German politics, as we know, to trade importing economic migrants against importing refugees and retraining them. Because Germany was the one country, and still is, by the way, uh, with one million jobs unfulfilled, less now, uh, economic growth, budgetary surplus, and compassion. So for the chancellor, it was an opportunity to combine all this. Okay, doesn't work this well in terms of uh, uh, popularity in the polls, obviously, regional and uh, uh, national, but this was the bet. At the same time, of course, what was asked of Mr. Tusk and Mr. Juncker was, you go to Turkey and you tell them to keep the migrants. Okay, that has three different implications. One, it's illegal according to EU law, because EU law, that is a directive of 2013, which is the implementation directive of the Geneva Convention on Refugees and its various amendments, says the EU will not return uh, uh, would-be refugees to countries that are not applying the Geneva Convention. And Turkey is not applying in full the Geneva Convention. It's applying the Geneva Convention to people coming from Europe. And of course, they are not coming from Europe. They're all coming from Africa or Asia or the Middle East. Uh, so that is illegal in our own EU terms. Then, of course, it's not exactly moral uh, to do that. But finally, politicians have simple objectives, and they said the numbers have to go down, as if refugees are numbers, but excuse the language, that is the terminology they use. And they told Mr. Tusk and Mr. Juncker, you go to Ankara and you put money on the table and you agree. The tragic mistake back then was that they added concessions, quote-unquote, on pre-existing negotiations on accession and on visas, which have their own track, their own conditionality. And this was a lot more than Ankara ever expected. So that negotiation lasted from uh, September, October, until March 2016. The deal was done, and now we are in a different situation. Of course, because of the other conditionality, neither the visa negotiation nor the accession negotiation can move anywhere. The return policy doesn't work well. Okay, That is the EU part. Then on the Turkish side, there's something totally amazing that the 3 billion euro deal is working like no humanitarian operation in EU history has been working. Amazing speed, amazing efficiency, and enthusiastic, I insist on enthusiastic, Turkish interlocutors. Ministry of Health, Ministry of Interior, Ministry of um, Education, AFAD, the Emergency Situation Agency, and the Red Crescent. On the level of the bureaucrats, people working on, on, with refugees. On the operational now. level, people handling all this. And, and good things are happening. Not only people are, are fed, educated, retrained, and so on, but 178 uh, health centers are, are being set up. Local communities where the infrastructure has been overwhelmed is also served by this. Uh, Syrians are employed to be doctors for their own compatriots, etc., etc. So it's working fine. But at the same time, at political level, you can have at least once a week, sometimes more, uh, the president, the prime minister, the foreign minister, and the EU minister saying, this deal is no good, we haven't seen the money. Now, the money you can always, in, in any aid operation, measure in three different ways. Commitment, uh, the um, actual contracting, and the expenditure. So as of next week, next month, sorry, in three weeks' time, about, the next round of uh, statistics be, will be published, and three billion will have been uh, committed. Two point something will have been contracted, and more than one billion will have been spent already. Of course, not everything is spent on day one, unless you decide to distribute the money blindly, which is of course not what the EU does, because this is public money, and we spend it according to procedures and court of auditors and this and that. So there we are.
Another, uh, another component of the region that we don't think of as part of the Middle East region always, but that's also had, had a very important role to play in Turkey-EU relations, is the, uh, the island of Cyprus. And looking at a map, you see how, how uh, integral it is to the region. Uh, Ambassador Salin, you, you have, have some, some uh, thoughts on Cyprus. Ten seconds only, no. because I really think that it's time for the audience now, but it needs to be mentioned that one year ago, there was a lot of hope pinned yeah. in overall EU-Turkey relations that fi finally there would be uh, there was hope of the silver lining. And uh, it seemed to be have been very close. It's been seen like that before, and then it didn't work. I think that this was a big, big setback for any chances to to reverse the vicious circle in many ways. And now there's big uncertainty as to whether and if and when to resume those talks, if the federal federated solution is at all of interest to, to Turkey any longer. Just to also add to what Mark just said, that I saw a figure mentioned by someone from the Commission, Mark, that EU, the EU since 2007 has spent more than 1 billion euro in total of support for democratization of Turkey. And some in, in Brussels may think now that what use was that money? We are actually uh, precisely on schedule. Uh, and, and according to my schedule, now is the time for you in the audience to contribute with your uh, astute questions. And I will encourage you to, to uh, formulate them as questions. I'm wondering if we have any questions down here. We have some uh, splendid ex expertise. Sometimes we criticize Turkey for not... Uh, uh, Bitte was talking about the lack of expertise and understanding of, of the Middle East and reading it, but there are individual splendid examples. Genghis, do you have any uh, spontaneous uh, responses or questions that you would like to, to share with us to mm. kick off? We have, we have a microphone coming here. While you're, you're formulating your question, um, let me also say that if you want to tweet about the event, please use the hashtag uh, UI events, hashtag UI event. Um, and then also, wait, I think I've gotten one new uh, Twitter follower during this uh, presentation who might be in this room. Thank you for that. Uh, if you want me to ask a question on your behalf, just uh, uh, tag me in your tweet and I'll see it uh, on the podium here and I'll ask it on, uh, for you. But uh, Genghis Chandar, uh, visiting, another distinguished visiting fellow at the, the Stockholm University Institute for Turkish Studies. Yes, go ahead. And, and renowned expert of, of, uh, of the Middle East. You can sit, it's fine. <laughs> so, uh, before asking the question to Ambassador Salin, I just want to point out some detail which I think is important for the audience to grasp that when you look at the map, this map is one of the best maps I've ever seen in terms of visualizing, visualizing the situation. But uh, just to remind uh, the, the audience, the area uh, between two yellow areas controlled by STF or YPG, let us say, the uh, distance between the northern northernmost point to the southernmost point, which is Al Bab, town Al Bab, is 30 kilometers. So the distance is from here, North Nurtul, even before Arlanda, uh, skyscraper, and it's a flat area, uh, topographically, physically, there is no any obstacles, no rivers, no mountains, no valleys, it's, and no forestation also. It's a flat area, and it took three months for the second largest army of North, North Atlantic Alliance to reach from the frontier to that point under the Russian air cover. So this this is an area uh, the, yes. that's now operated uh, or by by the, Turkish military forces. What is, what is forces. The, the the operation Euphrates Shield? So it shows how reliable the operational capability of the Turkish military after the botch coup of uh, 15 July. This is one point I just want to make. The other one about Idlib. Um, so it's it's very misleading. You see a whole province of Idlib painted in green, which means the Syrian opposition. But according to the Astana agreement, the checkpoints, the the uh, Russians and this, uh, the Iranians committed to the uh, to the uh, west of the, the 
the Orontes River, which is, uh, uh, excuse me, to the east of the Orontes River, uh, where HTS or Al Nusra or Al Qaeda, whatever you name is, does not exist. So, as you said, uh, Ambassador Salin, the dirty job is uh, given on, the, on, on Turkey to do. But the Turkish uh, government made a dirtier job, in a sense. They, they acquiesced with HTS or Al Nusra that they are not touching them. And uh, uh, they deployed right uh, when you see green uh, uh, okay. touching to the, uh, the yellow area, which is Afrin. They are positioned, few hundreds of Turkish troops positioned over the hilltops looking down over to, to Afrin. So there is no real Turkish operation uh, 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 taking place uh, 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 in terms of cleansing uh, the control of Idlib province from the Al-Qaeda Al elements. So, uh, and this is maybe one of the issues that will be taken today in, in Sochi. Uh, what could be the deal between Russia and Turkey? Because Turkey side is asking a free hand over Afrin, while there are Russian troops in Afrin itself. And what Russians ask from Turkey is to do the dirty job on the western part of the Orontes River. So, uh, after these observations, so let me uh, get to the question that I want to ask to, to uh, Ambassador Salim, which puzzled my mind a lot uh, in your uh, presentation. In the last sentence, when you were talking about uh, yeah, but, but before that, let me just add that uh, before coming here, when I was uh, having the privilege of conversation with my good old friend, uh, Ambassador Pierini, I told him that there is a disbelief in the Western circles about Turkey's drifting away from Western relations and even NATO all the way towards this Eurasianist appeal to Russia, to a certain extent to Iran and may ultimately to China maybe in the future. Uh, but many in the Western milieu, in the Western circles, including the Turkish traditional uh, uh, school of diplomacy, the former ambassadors or maybe still acting ambassadors, uh, some people in the Turkish intelligentsia cannot believe in this. That they think that these are tactical maneuvers or moves with with no strategic vision, and it would not happen. One day, Turkey will be back on the track. When I ask them, why do you think so? I mean, when it will happen, and how it will happen, there is no question. Just an outburst of disbelief. But gradually, incrementally, but surely, Turkey is drifting away from the West and from its institutions, not only the realm of West, but also institutionally, it's drifting away. So uh, Ambassador Salim touched this issue in his talk, and but the end, at the end of his, his uh, presentation, he said it might have a big cost on Turkey. So what is that big cost that you have in mind? What might happen to Turkey mm -hmm. if finally, if it goes away from NATO, even to the extent that it leaves its membership in NATO and finally changes camps. What will become of Turkey that you have in mind which made you to produce the word it will cost a lot? What's that cost? What's the bill? All right, Master Salim. Um, this is a very interesting uh, correction or request. Now, uh, what I had in mind, or I should say two things. One is, I know very well Okay, but no, you shouldn't, you shouldn't, Jengis, you know better than that, really. Um, on Afrin and Iblid, yes, the first stage meant observation post, and Turkey has been arguing with the Russians uh, time and again about being permitted, because it is uh, Russians uh, calling the shots, to do something inside Afrin. We'll see what happens there. But uh, you're right about the border between the part 
observed by uh, by Iran and Russia and, and the other parts. Whether it's dirty or not, maybe. But anyway, so that's it. Now, I had in mind uh, my personal belief that longer term, it is not in the interest of 80 million Turks to be completely dependent on the whims and caprices of Russia as the Black Sea region becomes a hot area of East-West relations and not retain the the rig stud, the, the coverage from having this uh, balancing factor because relations between Russia and Turkey are so uneven that it would be uh, somehow a loss if Turkey would be uh, depriving itself or be deprived of this uh, balancing power. That, that's what I meant. If you think that's wrong, we can continue next lunch or something. Yeah, so, I mean, I had that in mind. Uh, but Turkey is so, has so many interests in so many directions. But I meant that. So uh, I, I uh, said before that I tried to uh, put on a, the, the Turkish hat and ask the question from Ankar's perspective. We actually do have somebody who actually wears the Turkish hat from, from the embassy. Uh, and uh, would you care to, to ask a question? Hi. Good, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mr. Rob. I'm the Chargé d'Affaires right now of Turkey, and I'm, I'm the counselor normally. We have a new ambassador in town, but he did not uh, present his credentials yet to His Majesty. So that will be soon. Well, uh, I will not ask a question. I will just comment a little bit, but I think it's my role. Uh, I have an official casket, so uh, I'm sure uh, I'm like, I will be the virus to you. I will be like a virus to you, but this is my role. I'm here to provoke because we saw a very negative and dark image of Turkey. Of course, we are aware that some things are not going right, and everybody is uh, co conscious of that. But still, please uh, do not just put negative things. I mean, there are many positive things going. Uh, there are many trade uh, agreements going. Uh, Swedish companies are investing in Turkey. It's a huge market, 5% growth, things like that. Culture, students. I mean, always there is like a propaganda, anti-Turkish propaganda. They are bad. The French saying "tête de Turc," Mr. Ambassador. Uh, that is uh, used like that for Turks right now. So, uh, yes, EU is still our main role and our goal. I'm sorry, is our main goal. Whatever people say, this is our strategic orientation, and it's a, since the Ottoman Empire. Maybe this will shock you. It has always been the West, and this will not change. We, unfortunately, we do not have neighbors like Switzerland or Finland or Denmark. We have, unfortunately, more complicated area. We live in a complicated area. You talked a lot about Kurds. Kurds are part of Turkey. We, we, we are a, a melting pot. I'm maybe half Bulgarian, half Greek, uh, and something else. This is very normal. But we have a, a existential issue. We, they are trying to create a new state in Syria. What, what happened in Spain recently? Please, be a little bit frank and start being, stop being arrogant. There's this real arrogance and uh, duplicity on EU side. Uh, what happened after the coup? Nothing. EU did not say anything. They waited that we started to, uh, to go on stage and talk badly to countries and say, oops, we did wrong. So let's go and meet the Turk. The first person, EU person who met who contacted us was Mr. Dak, uh, uh, Mr. Jagland, the EU, uh, the yes, yes, uh, the official visit. You did not contact us, and this was a big. The perception of EU in Turkey also is not very good, unfortunately. And I'm, I, I, I have always been working for the EU idea, so it's a pity for me. So you are talking a lot about also the YPG. Uh, the PKK, yes, PKK is a terrorist organization, and they are killing people. And this, there, it was a little bit presented as like freedom fighters. And this is a pity because you worked in Turkey. You should be more open to this. And YPG, the same leaders almost. Did you check who, who, who leads the PKK? Who leads the YPG? They're about the same person. So please, what is the problem? They are giving arms to. Uh, the Syrian Democratic Forces, which is composed of 80% or something like that of PKK elements, little bit uh, other composition just to show that they are not only Kurdish forces, they give arms. These arms are smuggled into Turkey and used against our militaries. 
And what is a PT? Sometimes it's EU origin uh, weapons. I'm not going to name any country, but we live in a country where it produces arms, man pads, and these are used against our soldiers. What would you do if, uh, if people killed your soldiers with uh, weapons given to a terrorist organization to fight another terrorist organization? Mr. Pierini, Ambassador Pierini, uh, said very right, proxy war. Well, if you do not wish to do the dirty job, Unfortunately, we will have to do it. And Mr. Chandar said that Turkish, uh, the, the army has no operational capability. Well, we're the only sole ones who fought that. And thousands of uh, Daesh militants were killed and eliminated. So you should be grateful for that. Uh, and also on the customs union, uh, you are talking that it's like something given to Turkey. No, it's more interested also for EU uh, and we should develop our relations. I mean, 50% of our trade is with the EU. But uh, don't forget that we apply EU law without being part of, uh, in the process of uh, creating that law. We just applied law. Do you think that this is fair? We apply the common economic tariffs of the EU without having no say. They just sent us a document saying, well, you need to increase the taxes on this, decrease in taxes in that. Do you think that it is fair? Can you name me a country which still has a visa and which is in the process of negotiations with the EU? One country, please do name me. If I'm wrong, I'm, I will uh, say that I'm sorry. All right. And, I think last, we'll, and last but not last least, Kasri yeah. Shirin is the first in 1639, Madam uh, Hammer uh, So it's indeed the first uh, docu the, the, the agreement. There has only been a little switch of lands, uh, some mountainous areas uh, in the 19th century. Thank you very much. I cannot answer to everything, and I will not go into current politics. I wanted just to show the frame. And last five seconds on Cyprus issue. After the Annan plan, they promised the Turkish Cyprus uh, to lift the embargo of the EU. What happened today? Please uh, comment on that as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. I gave you a little extra space because, as I said earlier, I wa we, we wanted to have the Turkish perspective in the, in the panel. So I think that was valuable. Uh, responses from the panel? Mr. Pierini? Yeah. Well, Mr. Charge d'Affaires, uh, obviously you have to do your job. I recognize that. I note with regret that in the uh, brief of Turkish diplomats, we have now the words of arrogance and duplicity against Europe. Uh, well, that's part of your brief. Fine, I take note. Now, in the end, this situation is fairly simple. Uh, the fate of Turkey is in the hands of Turkish voters, not ours here. Okay? So they will decide what they want. Uh, but And there are indeed, as you said, and as I said, a lot of positive relations. And certainly the customs union is one where both sides benefited. The Turkish Automotive industry, for example, was completely revamped and is now a full part of the European automotive industry. Well, that's fine. What we have now is a different issue. It's not that business will work with business or uh, with a modernized or not modernized customs union or that academics will work with academics or people of culture or whatever. The problem is the political alliance. The political alliance cannot be there anymore until such time the Turkish leadership apologizes for using the term Nazi remnants and, quote, unquote, the English translation, I'm sorry, if they were not ashamed, they would reignite the gas chambers. Okay? So that you have to understand, and I'm sure you understand it because you live here, uh, is the ultimate insult you can use against European politicians. Not German politicians, European politicians. And I will explain that to you. I was born in 1947, so I'm a baby boomer with two generations before me involved in World War I and World War II. In my family, they killed a lot of Germans because they defended France, okay? My father even went to war against Italy, the land of his own father, okay? So these things have been a terrible tr tragedy for Europe for decades, and I am part of the generation that turned the page. To the point that when I joined the commission in the late 70s, and my father called, he said, how is it going? What language do you speak? Who are your bosses? And I said, well, my bosses are a German, a Belgian, a German. And he was speechless. He couldn't believe his son was working under the orders of a German. This is what we've done. Okay? And if now a country that wants to join, and you said yourself that this is the first priority of the Turkish government to be part of Europe, you telling us, your president is telling us, 
if you were not ashamed, you would recognize the gas chambers, I'm saying sorry. I will not vote for any party in my country who would say yes to that. That's the point. And, and you have to, I gave you my example, there are millions, tens of millions of families who, who have the same story. I mean, you can talk to anyone you want across Europe, same story. Okay? So that is the bridge broken. And this, you have to realize that this has happened not because of us. This has happened because of Turkish politics, because of political play. Okay? When you tell Turkish German citizens not to vote for CDU and SPD and the Greens because these are the enemies of Turkey, what do you want me to say? You know, this is not part of the political game within Europe. And therefore, you're going to face a massive resistance, not from Germany, from many European countries, perhaps not some of them, uh, against this particular type of language. This is a political reality. I'm not inventing it. You can read it every day. It's in a the difficult to politicize climate, no doubt, and unfortunately in relations today. I'm wondering if we have a, some, a few questions. Uh, I'm going to collect just a couple of questions. Uh, Rather brief questions if you want comments from the, the panel, because we have to end very, very soon. We have one question up there, uh, and Ragip, we have one question down here. So try to be brief and succinct with your, your questions, and then you will get answers. But just when are we finishing? In, so in about three knows. minutes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So very brief. Please. Thank you. Uh, I'm also from Turkey. and. Uh, Unfortunately, I want to agree with uh, Mr. I don't remember his name uh, okay. from the ambas embassy uh, because yeah something is going on. Talk about it's not it's not a uh, we don't need to draw a pessimistic view because uh, we have been going through those things uh, for a long time. It's not the it's, it didn't begin with AKP. Uh, Apart from that, uh, we, uh, Mrs. Uh, Bitte said that Erdogan is not a trust, or Turkey see, ha, is seen as uh, is not seen as a trusted country in the region uh, because uh, it has nothing to do with co uh, consistency. I agree with that because uh, before AKP, we had. Uh, really structured and uh, developed foreign ministries services and uh, for someone to be um, to work at uh, foreign minister offices he has or she has to go through long way to to do that you have to phrase it as a question just very quickly because we oh, have okay. to wrap up and uh, okay uh, then then uh, we don't have such system it, it depends on one person uh, my question is do you think EU has disappointed? I don't think EU has disappointed AKP. It has support, supported from the beginning it has, because it has bilateral gains. Do you think EU has disappointed democratic, democratic uh, society in Turkey? Very good question. Yeah. Uh, and Draghi Pedi, we have, you have a very brief question. Uh, I admire of this uh, map. Mm -hmm. Also, this map uh, explains uh, a lot about the Turkish uh, policy. There is a huge, nearly, I think, 900 kilometer uh, border area under the Kurdish control. De facto, there is a Kurdish reality in the region now. So, the, um, it's very, uh, I think, it's very understandable, Ankara positions. Uh, about uh, the Middle East, it is uh, might be we can see very uh, there is no mentality, but there is a mentality. Basic, it is the uh, the Kurdish reality uh, now decided for Turkish policy. So more than Ankara, the Kurdish reality decide about the regional uh, policy. Uh, we see contradictionary. And now this area is uh, internationally is uh, 
reality to decide the politicians. For example, this region is a friendly area for Amer United States power in the region, mm. but also the Russia is counting this importance. And what do you think about the Kurdish question? Okay, so let's have uh, f five second answers from, from uh, the panelists uh, in order to, to wrap up. The depletion of the foreign ministry, the, uh, the, the, the plum, diplomatic yeah, did, did the EU disappoint yeah. the Turkish Democrats? Certainly, yes, they disappointed me too. Uh, you know, I, I'm a French citizen and five months into my term, in my five-year, two-month term in, in Turkey, uh, Mr. Sarkozy was elected uh, president of France and he became hostile to Turkey because this is Asia Minor and based on a number of assumptions or pre conceived ideas that I didn't agree with, except that he was elected. Okay, So that is uh, a difficulty that you will always face uh, given the evolution of uh, the democracies in, in Europe. What I think is uh, remaining an important element is that, as I described in my blog yesterday, uh, you have, despite all the acrimony the opposition, Nazi remarks and this and that, and the German being upset and so on, you still have a few things that you have to deal to deal with, irrespective of the political mood. Counterterrorism is one, refugees is another one, customs union is another one. So uh, it it leaves on the side, at least for the moment or until further notice, the dream of a political alliance, because there you don't have the basic ingredients, but you still have a job to do. You still have relations to conduct. And as you know, part of the EU position last month in the European Council was to allocate more efforts and resources to the defense of human rights in Turkey. All right. And uh, while remaining two speakers, what about the the, the, the fact that Turkish foreign policy is in part guided by the fait accompli of a large Kurdish autonomous region on its border that it perceives as a threat in, in five seconds or more or less? Yes. Use my five seconds to say um, I'm not sure exactly what you think that I said that you made uh, made you react, but I uh, I respect you doing your work. But there is so much to say, so much more on the border issues. Because uh, I wish we had three hours. I do have a strategic understanding for what it means to be part of a regional pattern which leaves issues from the Sykes-Picot and Sevres and Lausanne somehow, and, and de Montreux unsettled, facing a very, very uncertain future. I haven't worked on behalf of the EU other than in Macedonia, but I do think that there are lots of things, including Cyprus, which uh, would call for non-arrogant uh, broad-mindedness in the understanding. That was my five seconds. Some humility from the EU's point of view. Yes, yes. bit uh, final words. Okay, five. Well, to, speaking about the Kurds, they, they are a geographical reality, historic reality, and at the end of the day, it's something that Turkey has to deal with. Also, those are now, I mean, in the mountains or the insurgents, Turkey tried to do so before and will have to do so at the end of the day. Also knowing that the Kurds are not united themselves, as you very well know, going for different directions and different ideology. Thank you. And I can, in conclusion, say that I just spent a week in Turkey uh, interviewing NGOs. Uh, and I can say that even though a lot of people are working under difficult pressures, there's a lot of uh, hope and, and activism uh, uh, vibrant still uh, in Turkey. And uh, let's not uh, forget that. Thank you all for coming. Thank you to the panelists. Please join me in thanking them. Thank you.